Ladies and gents, uh, good afternoon, Eve. Uh, my name is Simon Brown. So this evening, the remit was quite simple, um, investing for income, uh, which is I mean, when you invest, there's basically one or two things you're trying to do. One is capital appreciation. You want the, 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 the value of the investment to increase. And the other one is income. In other words, you want to extract money from it. And you're going to get bits of both as a rule. You, you know, if you invest for capital appreciation, you're going to get the dividends. And if you invest for dividends and you do it smartly, you're going to get the capital appreciation. The trick is, which is the focus and, and how do we blend that focus to put them together and to make them work? And mostly I need to turn that on. Um, and, and normally we look at it and we say, yeah, you know, income's great, but it really is a retirement strategy. It's something we're going to do when we hit retirement. We'll start focusing on income. Uh, and right now, our focus is going to be really on the, the sense of, of let's grow this, this pile of cash we've got as fast as we can. And that's not, not completely wrong, but not completely right either. And I'm going to keep on coming back to the point. But I'm always a fan. I, I don't have my portfolio is not income focused, but I have slices of my portfolio that are there to generate income for me. In other words, I'm aiming for the higher dividend yields and the like. And there's a fairly simple reason to it. A portfolio gets cash into it basically one of three ways. Either you sell something, which in my life I do fairly infrequently. Uh, alternatively, you are depositing fresh cash into the portfolio, which is nice, but often easier said than done. And the third way we get in that in is from dividends and the like that we're receiving. So if you don't need any income at the moment, when I get those dividends flowing, and I, I mean, I'd love dividends. I call them free money. I get it. I paid for the free money, but it's free money to me. But when that money flows in, I then just reinvest it. So it gives me a, a boost to that capital. And initially, it starts tiny. Absolutely. Initially, there, there's not a heck lot. You know, the money coming in is not huge. Um, and we'll run the numbers this evening and get to that point as well. So it's either for that living on or it's for that investing back into the market. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, I, I, I've been doing the income thing since my 30s, not because I need the money or I need the red wine. We always need money in red wine. Um, but because my focus is that just gives me more capital I can deploy back into the market and, and, and buy assets with. The trick is buying the right stuff. So there are a bunch of different asset classes. Of course, there's the vanilla JC shares that we have that are listed, some 450 odd or so of them. They obviously fit into the space which we can use for, for uh, income investing. Um, we've got listed property. I, I, I'm quite a fan of listed property for income, but there, there, there's some issues. Firstly, the, the change in, in the way the move to REITs has made a significant difference to the tax treatment of listed property. So there's certainly an attraction there. Uh, the other attraction to listed property is that they, they, they traded a premium to their net asset value, right? They've got a physical building, 100 bucks worth of building, and they do trade at a premium to that net asset value, maybe is 10 or 20, in some cases, 30 or more percent above it. But that premium to net asset value is still markedly lower than the premium that a typical stock would trade on. A normal share in the JSC, our banks are trading at about twice the net asset value. Uh, our industrials are trading at about four times the net asset value. And in many cases with banks and industrials, a lot of that net asset value is not tangible. In other words, you can't actually turn it into cash. With property, of course, it's a real building. Now, we could argue that the building could be in the wrong location. There's issues about that. It could be badly managed. It could be in bad condition. But there is a physical building that exists. So your two, and then I want to say two, your risks in property are a serious premium to net asset value. And back in the day, you know, in the 1990s, you actually bought property at a discount to net asset value. I think those days have gone. I think that was an inefficiency we saw in our market. Um, but when the tough times come, property often will hold up better because of that underpinning. With the proviso, it depends on their debt levels. With property, we've got to see what their debt is. Because, of course, what are they doing? They're borrowing money, buying buildings, managing the buildings, paying the debt off, and then taking that and paying the rest to the shareholders. So in the property space, to me, the issue more than anything, yes, location, types of property, industrial versus commercial versus uh, retail. But to me, what I really look hard at is debt levels. 
always going to be focusing on those debt levels and, and look at what those are. What am I looking for in, in a property? I'm happy to push the debt levels, depending on the property, up to 50, even 55% debt of their net asset value. Um, we've got some properties in this market where the debt levels are closer to 120% of net asset value. That's great while it lasts, but that's obviously risky. And we've got some stocks where their, their debt levels are down in sub 30%. And that's certainly the space I'm looking at because, A, it means in a rising interest rate environment, they're going to be less susceptible to it. But also equally important is that they can actually therefore raise debt. If you've got 30% debt to, to net asset value and suddenly, I don't know, a great building comes up or an asset that you want to buy, you can raise more debt without stretching that balance sheet. If you're already at 50 or 60 or even 70%, yeah, you can push your debt higher, but you're, you're, to my mind, you get into that tipping point. So I like those stocks sort of around the, the 25 to 30% debt, uh, debt levels. And we'll come to hard examples in time uh, later in the presentation, so we will get there. Um, unlisted property, look, I'm completely biased. I had really bad tenants when I had unlisted property. So I, I you know, if we compare, so short answer, unlisted property, the biggest benefit of unlisted property is you take a 100,000 rand deposit, the bank gives you a million rand loan, lacquer. Uh, a whole lot of if, buts, and maybes, right? You've got a lot of costs involved in terms of maintenance and all of the upkeep and everything else. You've got tenants. I had a tenant who moved out. She then let the place to somebody else and stopped paying me the rent. So when I went banging on the door and this oak opens a door and I say, who are you? He says, I'm the tenant. And he asks me who I am. I said, I'm the landlord. He says, no, you're not. Um, and she'd done, a, she'd done a runner and was taking my money. And I just sold the whole bunch. The other trick you have is location. The, the beauty of listed property is you buy one asset and you've got location all over the place. Whereas, you know, unless you seriously got, got, got wads of cash, you're going to be, you know, initially one property and then two and three. But also the classes. We as individuals typically go straight to residential. And it's not the best property asset class. You really want to be doing commercial, light industrial gives you significantly better returns uh, in, in that space. So to me, it really is about listed property rather than, 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 than unlisted property. And of course, your primary, your home, your primary residence is not included in that whatsoever. Uh, that's a house, a home, not a, an investment by any stretch. Debt, and I'm not talking about lending your buddy 100 bucks and hoping he pays you back, um, rather than, although depending on the buddy, maybe if you lend him 100 bucks and he never wants to, you know, he hides from you, that might be a, a benefit. I'm talking about debt in the forms of uh, government bonds, I'm talking about debt in the form of, of preference shares and the like. And we'll delve into those. There's certainly some issues and challenges around, around both of those asset classes. Uh, there are some, some benefits to it uh, and some nuances. So we'll delve a whole bunch in, 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 into, into that space. We can, of course, look offshore for yield. The problem with going offshore looking for income is that the, because of the, the differential between interest rates, now, because we've got prime at around 10% and the equivalent in America is around 1%, and in fact, Europe is going deeper into negative rates and so is Japan and the rest of the world is cutting while we are raising rates. When we go overseas, what is a great yield internationally is not a great yield. You know, America gets deadly excited about 2.5%. I'm like, I don't get out of bed for 2.5%. Um, so there's that disconnect. Another issue is that in America, they have dividend withholding tax of 30%. We've only got 15. Now, we can claim half of that back if you do the paperwork and pay the fees. But it means that American companies are not big on paying dividends. Typically, they, with their profits, what they like to do is share buybacks. Now, we can argue whether that's good, bad, or ugly. The reality is that's what they do. Um, because that boosts the share price in theory and because their capital gains rate is a third of what their, their dividend tax rate is. So if you look at North America, well, no, not North America, because that includes Canada. If you look at the United States of America, what we get is a situation where there just isn't much yield around. We'll touch on one or two, but we certainly don't see a heck of a lot there. And then, of course, unit trusts. And the issue with unit trusts is really, really simple. I have little or no knowledge or experience in them. I actually was supposed to do an interview this week. The last time I bought, I went and checked my records. The last time I bought a unit trust was 19 years ago and I was paying 6% fees. And that 
was not including performance fees because there was no performance. The thing was diving off the end of a fay. I, I was paying advisor fees and platform fees and and that still just burnt into my brain that frankly everyone was getting rich except me. Um, obviously there's an entire field of, of income in the unit trust space as is always the case. Go and, 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 and you know pull the thing apart. Do that due diligence. What are they investing in? One of the property stocks which is really giant holding in the income space. It pops up on my radar, but I draw a line through it. I don't, I'm not comfortable with that particular stock. We'll talk about it later. And, and maybe they're right and I'm wrong. I mean, I'm not saying that, that they're the wrong ones here. It's just understand what's in that fund. Always the case. Know what's inside what you're buying is critically important. And then let's touch some risks because, well, with anything in life, I mean, so, you know, you want risk-free, you put the money under your bed, uh, the risk there is that your house burns down or the kids find it and spend it. Um, the reality is that if that doesn't happen, you, you, you're getting poorer just by a process of inflation. So, you know, so your risk is dividends disappear or shrink or that you get capital depreciation or that you get both. Now, three examples there, <clears throat> African Bank, Kumba and PPC. And all of them did the disappearing dividend and the uh, capital uh, uh, depreciation where the share price falls. Uh, Kumba at one point, and I'm not talking in the last year, if you just go back to, to a couple of years ago, Kumba dividend yield was 9, 10, 11%. Today's Kumba's dividend yield, zero. Two, three years ago, Kumba's share price was 400 bucks, 450. Today, Kumba's share price, I actually don't know, somewhere between 80 and 100, or maybe between 50 and 100, but certainly significantly down. So there are two issues. And let's touch with the capital depreciation. It's not easy. There are ways we can, but there's not easy where we can in the short term say we want this capital to not depreciate. We, we ideally don't want it to, you know, we, in the, over the medium term, sort of if we look longer than three or five years out, we want our capital to, to be fairly stable. In the one or two years, there might be some fluctuation. But in the case of, of an African banks, I get it, an extreme, but certainly in the case of those three there, African Bank, Kumba, and PPC, the share prices have taken an absolute pounding, and will they ever recover? African Bank won't. They're bankrupt. PPC and Kumba, I mean, is PPC going back to its lofty days? I don't think so. Is Kumba going back to 600 Rand? Ish, I can't see that. And maybe it is. But, you know, which decade are we looking at to get Kumba back to its 600? The, the fundamentals that drove it to that level are gone. So what are we, what are we looking at there? The, the, the one is we're looking at cyclical stocks. Kumba is cyclical. It'll have boom and bust. It's going to have those times when the iron ore price goes to $180 a ton. And then it'll have the times when iron ore goes back to 40. And, and who knows where it's going next? So what you don't want is cyclical businesses. That's the last thing you want in an in a income generating portfolio. Because if you're a cyclical business, what that means is you're going to have the bust times and your income is going to simply disappear. Will it come back? We can be generous and say yes but not necessarily. We also got to look at what I call a bulletproof business. Now, let's take PPC. In one sense, cement, yeah, bulletproof. Man, there's always going to be a demand for cement. But we got to look at, at more than just that. If we delve into it, what happened in the, in the cement business? We saw a massive boom in the lead up to the World Cup. Car trains and stadiums and all of those sort of things were being built. And now what? Now there's nothing left to build. Well, there's a lot left to build, but unless we go and build some nuclear power stations, um, and there are not many folks trampling that story, what do we build now to raise that demand? The other problem that, that, that PPC ran into was simply getting outgunned by the new kids in the block. So let's exclude PPC's expansion into, into the rest of Africa. If you look at their South African assets, the average age of those assets in South Africa is 40 plus years. You can't take a 40-year-old cement plant and compete against Sopaku, who have got a you know 40-week-year-old. You just can't compete on price. So we need to 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 find those bulletproofs, and we've got some examples. I'll come to, and we'll delve into those. Um, you know, Astral was another. Astral's currently has a great dividend yield, and in the past has had a great dividend yield. It's also at points in time had zero dividend yield. Um, 
one of their major inputs is 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 maize. We know that maize is a is a is a cyclical operation. You know, we currently in a drought, so maize is through the roof. At some point, we're going to have far too much maize, and the price will collapse. We want that much more a, a consistency running through that process. That's what we're aiming for. Boring. I, you know, nothing wrong with boring in the investment space. Um, we absolutely want, want boring stuff. Tax law is always an issue, with one exception. Of course, if you're in a tax-free savings account, then the tax laws don't bother you. But you know, we, we have seen changes. So we used to have secondary tax in companies at 10%. That was done away. When the new tax, dividend withholding tax, was brought in, it was brought in at 15%. So there's always that risk that there are changes and tweaks there. I fully expected uh, Minister Gordon to increase the dividend withholding tax in his budget speech last month. It was an easy one, right? You raise it from 15 to 20. You point to America and say we're cheaper than America. And if anyone complains, hey, you're a rich person, you own shares, keep quiet, we've got poor people. I thought it was an easy tax raise. It didn't happen. Um, I, I think it must be on their shopping list. It has to be on the shopping list. So they pushed up capital gains to a degree. I think we'll see capital gains this year. Uh, I think the other two that are going to come through will be, uh, we'll see an increase in dividend withholding tax, and we'll see an increase in secondary uh, securities transfer tax. That's 0.25% you pay on the buy side. And maybe he's going to stagger one this year, one next, and one the year after. But those are easy increases that don't, they're not as efficient as raising VAT by a percent or two, but they, they're palatable, they're easy, they're defendable. So I think we will see that. So that's a, a real uh, uh, risk that's coming through. Um, and the other risk is, you know, I say, you want the company, the sector, the dividend to be rock solid. And if we look at African Bank, an African Bank for a long time, and, and Lex, Lex, so African Bank went down in 2014, August. Let's look way back. Let's take African Bank back to around 2010 or there's about. It was fairly rock solid. I mean, I always thought Kumba, was, uh, Kumba Capitec was the, the better option. But nonetheless, if you delved into it, it looked fairly impressive. It looked like it was doing the right stuff. And the lesson there is that sometimes the best laid plans go awry. And when that happens, we need to dismount. You know, African Bank was 42 Rand and things started to go wrong. And there was a long way to exit before it went to zero. And in particular with African Bank, one of the key things that gave it away was just the, that, the dividend. If you go look back at African Bank, we were seeing earnings per share, headline earnings per share increasing. But the dividend was going sideways. Now, immediately, if you're making more profit, why aren't you increasing the dividend? It means there's something with your profit that's perhaps not quite there. But as an income investor, when dividend is your focus, and you've bought African Bank as an example for that dividend, and suddenly it starts going sideways, that is red lights. That is monster red lights. So what sort of yield are we looking for? I mean, you know, what sort of yield do we want? We want as much as possible. Let's not beat around the bush. 20% is nice. 60 is better. 100 is perfect. We're not going to get that. I mean, it, you know, uh, the oak you meet at a dodgy bar at night, you promises to double your money by Wednesday. I mean, yeah, okay, sure. How many whiskeys have you had? Um, it, it, there, there are no free lunches here. There, there was free coffee outside, but no free lunches. In essence, what we're going to get is a fairly modest in the first year or so. It's that ex escalation of it. And this is the point. If, if, if your need is for income today, it is exceedingly hard to do. If your need is for income in five years, ah, that gets easier. If your need for income is 10 plus years, then it's very, very easy to start today positioning that portfolio for that income and to start growing and building it now. In other words, buying assets where the, where the dividends are growing at that incredibly fast speed as we grow. So if we can do 20% you know, a year in growth of the dividends, doubles every four years. 10% doubles every seven. Now, we can probably do somewhere in between, and I've got a slide with a, 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 lot, more, a lot more detail there. And pref shares, I'm going to come back to them, don't fit into that. But what we're not going to do is knock it out the park. This is not a let's all get a fat dividend check on Monday morning. Well, a Monday morning, but not any Monday morning this year, and probably not either. We start with the base, and we start to grow it. And it's why, although technically I'm 19 years away from retirement, Although 
I might retire next year or I might retire when I'm 100, who knows. But I'm 19 years away, but I've already got stocks now, which I'm kind of hoping I still have in those 19 years' time. And if I do, they're going to be paying me hand over fist for, 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 for holding them. Now, will they last 19 years? Well, that's part of buying the bulletproof. Now, someone was saying to me the other day, the problem is companies don't stick around very long on our market. Ironically, the company that has been listed on the JSC for the longest, and they listed in 1888, which I think was two years after the JSC started, uh, DRD, Durban Rotopur Deep, ironically a gold mine. But a lot of companies simply don't stay particularly long. There, there, there are a bunch. There are many with decade-long histories, uh, some approaching century-long histories. But a lot of the stocks come, spend 10, 15, 20 years, and then fade off the other side. The trick is to find those, ideally, that are going to outlive us. And they're there. They absolutely exist. We've just got to be absolutely picky. And part of that process is not just chasing yield. You know, it's incredibly, there used to be one of the, the local publications used to do a dividend portfolio every year in their, in, in their publication. And basically what they would do is, is sort the list of JSC stocks by dividend yield and buy the 30 or 40 best dividend yield stocks. And it was nice, but in truth, it was completely meaningless. It was completely impractical. There were liquidity issues and it didn't really work. You know, one of the stocks, and I've got a list, one of the stocks with one of the highest dividend yields on our JSC at the moment is called Alliance Mining. It's in liquidation. That dividend yield is actually from 2007. But, you know, it hasn't yet been liquidated, so it's still there. So it pops up on your radar. So we can't just simply do the sort. And I'll show you that. I've got that picture up coming up in a, in a, in a moment. We'll look at that. The sector risk, I, so price going down in the short term. You buy something and the price goes down in the short term, and by that I'm talking anything three to five years or less, that doesn't particularly stress me. We're going to be hard-pressed to find something that is completely bulletproof in the short term. What I want is companies that will be there in 19 years' time, all things being equal, and companies that will survive the tough periods. And the tough periods may be tougher for some rather than others, but I want those that come out the other side. And, and there's certainly, and we'll, we'll name names in a moment, there certainly are those that, that do come through. I want dividend growth. I want dividend growth of double digit. So I want dividends to be growing north of 10% every single year, assuming that we are in an inflation environment that averages 5%. Because if my inflation is going at 5 and my dividend is going at 10, I am, I'm outpacing inflation. I'm creating wealth there. And in truth, dividend increases of, of north of 10% are not that hard to find. And we can even find quality companies. My favorite just gave me a 22% dividend increase year on year. Now, can it sustain 22%? Probably not. But if it's doing 22% at this point, and I think there's space to change their dividend cover, in other words, pay out more profit as dividend, We'll see a, a spurt of that over the next sort of three to five to six years. Um, dividend cuts scare the behemoth out of me. There are few companies that can go through a 2008 and not cut a dividend. I'm trying to find those that don't, and that is not easy. But more than that, so if you're going to have to cut a dividend, 2008 is one of those things that comes along fairly rarely, uh, and we, you know, we get through it. The question is, if you're going to cut it, how quickly before you get back to pre-cut levels? And some stocks are taking four, five, six years. That's too long. I, I, you know, I, I'm not granting you four or five or six years to get your dividend back up. And, of course, the big one, that yield is always historic. So we're always looking backwards. That's all we've got. We can't see into the future, so we're always going to be looking backwards. So preference shares, let's quickly touch on this. So what is a preference share? Preference share is a debt instrument. It has been issued by the big banks and other companies listed on our market. So the big banks will issue them, the second tier banks issue them, the Sassfins, the Capitex. Um, we've also got them coming out of the insurers. Uh, Astropac's got one, uh, Discovery's got, uh, uh, PSG, no, not PSG, I uh, saw an odd one the other day. There's bunches of them. They're basically debt instruments. Problem of debt. No capital appreciation. So you put your 100 bucks in and you get a nice 10% yield. That's lacquer. You're getting 10 rand in year one. But in year 20, you're still getting 10 rand. 
And 10 Rand don't buy you anything in year 20. Sorry? Short answer. So, so the, the problem with, I mean, the, the, the lack of, so preference share if, is a great place to park money for a short time. You know, you, you've got money, you don't know what to do with it. Do you want to park it for a year or two? Stick it in a preference share, earn 8, 9, 10% on it. Nice, come back, sell it and exit. Um, I bought some in the worst days of the crisis in 08 because you know, they were worth 100 Rand. They were trading at 70. I bought them. I sold them a few years later, earned some nice yield in the time. They link to the prime rate, so in a rising interest rate environment, they're nice. But your 10 Rand is going to be 10 Rand forever and a day. Another problem with preference shares. Two more problems. One, we get downgraded at the end of the year from Standard & Poor in their December review. Our banks get downgraded as well because a bank cannot have a rating higher than its sovereign. So any South African domiciled bank will get downgraded by Standard & Poor's at the same time to junk status. What's that going to do to the banks? I mean, I don't know. I mean, Sim Shabalala, Mike Brown releasing results in the last week, both spoke to it, and they both said it's bad. You know, it's not end of world bad but your cost of capital goes up. It's just not great for the... But what's it going to do to the preference shares? Will it create panic? Will the market knee-jerk and send the prices collapsing? Don't know. Do we want to be there and find out? Not sure. The other issue is that, and this gets massively complicated. This is a very simple version. If you want the complicated version, I can chat to you afterwards. Basel III is the capital adequacy requirements for banks around the world. Basel III is changing from Basel II, of course, and one of the changes is that preference shares are basically being phased out as capital adequacy. So the banks are going to get rid of their preference shares. We've already seen Capitec buying back their preference shares. The other banks are going to have to. Now, if you're Imperial, it's not a problem because capital adequacy is not an issue for you. But if you're a bank, you're going to be buying them back. And if we see a downgrade, and if we see preference shares collapse, won't that be the moment the banks swoop in to buy their preference shares? So suddenly it's not that you get capital depreciation, it's that you get it locked in. So on the surface, preference shares, great for parking cash, but just for parking for a year or two. And we'll touch on some specific details uh, uh, later in the presentation. Bonds... So bonds are going to be government bonds or state-owned enterprise bonds. And no, I'm not talking SAA or ESCOM. Although if you'd, or even Sanrail, if you'd bought ESCOM bonds uh, eight months ago, you've done incredibly well. Here's the trick with bonds. Again, I don't want to go massively deep into this, but the way bonds work, yield up, price down. In other words, if that yield is increasing, the yield is the flow of cash to you. If it's increasing, the value of your bond is decreasing. What are we seeing at the moment? Rising interest rate environment, potential downgrades, all of those mean yield up. This is not the time to be buying bonds. You want to be buying bonds at a, at, at a you know, you want to be buying bonds in about three or so years' time. But again, what have you got? You buy a bond and it says we will pay you 10 bucks a year for the duration of the bond. Great in year one, great in year two, not so great in year five, really not great in year ten because you're just getting that same 10 bucks coming back to you all the time. So they are, and we'll touch on those as well, um, and importantly, they pay interest, not dividend, different tax uh, processes. Your first 20-odd thousand, depending on age, is tax-free thereafter at your marginal tax rate. If you think 15% a lot, let's try 41% tax rate. So then quite simply, I say, cool, uh, I boogie along and I do a sort at my broker and I say, show me all the shares on the JSC with yields above 4%. This excludes property primarily because property is, 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 is not uh, picking up, we won't delve into that. Comes back with 77 stocks that yields more than 4%. I appreciate you can't see that. Top of the list is Delta with a yield of 36.96%. And you're thinking, who's Delta? Delta used to make batteries. They no longer make batteries. They're busy winding the company up. The reason it's got a giant yield is because they're closing the business down, so they returned a large amount of cash back to shareholders. The story. It's irrelevant to the process. But as you run your eye down this list, so there we have Alliance Mining, bankrupt. We have uh, 
uh, African bank uh, bankrupt. We have Astro. I mean, I, I, I you know, Chris Gitter, CEO, wonderful person, but uh, uh, cyclical. I mean, how much, how much chicken can a human being eat every day? Um, Lewis. Yeah, less said about Lewis, the better. Uh, running more up the list. Where do we get? Adcorp. Adcorp surprised me. I really like Adcorp. They do recruitment. They've just never quite, at Richard Pike's the CEO, they've never, I don't want to say they haven't delivered. But I suppose in truth, they haven't really. Certainly, they haven't delivered on share price. And the point with a stock that hasn't delivered on share price is what's going to kick it to deliver? What's going to change where the price is going to start moving? Now, sometimes the stock doesn't move because there's a big seller in the market. And what changes is the big seller runs out of stock, exits, price moves. Happened to Metrofar. There was a seller at 406. They've left stock gapped. But I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't get excited about that. Uh, where else do we go? MTN, enough said. Um, and then a whole bunch of, of <clears throat> CMH, Combined Motor Holdings. And just yesterday, um, West Bank say they expect vehicle sales for 2016 to be down 12% in South Africa. Yeah, you, know, you don't want a stock who's playing in a space where the market is shrinking. So pretty much that entire list there, nice, impressive, uh, thanks, but no thanks. Um, so then we really delve into it and I'll start pulling it apart. So then I've got to go and find stocks that give me good yield and that seem to fit my profile. And there were five that popped up, and we'll delve into them in detail. Barlow World, historic yield 4.6, forward yield probably about 5.1. ELB Group, historic is 5.1, and then they came out with a trading update this week. But ELB Group is uh, 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 engineering. Tough space to be in. Massively tough space. Vodacom, I think we all know, historic 5.4, uh, forward yield probably closer to 6 and some change. What I mean by forward yield is over the next 12 months is what you'll get. Metrofile, the asterisk is because I own it, 5.3, forward yield probably about 6.1. Clientel Life, you saw, you know those, those adverts you don't watch on TV because they are 45 minutes long? Hey, they must work, right? Because otherwise they would have changed their plan. I mean, they can't be stupid. Hello Giosi, who is one of the smartest people I know in this industry, you ask him for one share, Clientel Life. That's his share. If he's allowed to have one share in his life, it's clientele life. They, they, they sell insurance, but they do it incredibly well, incredibly smartly, and with 45-minute TV adverts. I know, we're not the target market, right? Somewhere out there, there's someone who watches a 45-minute advert for insurance. So that's the most depressing thing I've thought of all week. Um, but a massive 6% historic and a fairly chunky forward. What do we see here is fairly, so, I mean, is Barlow World non-cyclical? No, yellow equipment, whoa, that is cyclical, man. Those big uh, uh, Gunda Gundas, um, Caterpillar, that's what the word I was looking for. Sorry, Gunda Gunda, that's my childhood. Uh, I spent the afternoon with my nephew, that's why. Um, the the big uh, Caterpillars, they're great until, I mean, who's buying Caterpillars right now? You're not mining, you're not building. Uh, you're not buying any caterpillars. Um, ELB Group Engineering just came out with a trading update. Not fine at all. Vodacom. So Vodacom's interesting. Vodacom is not MTN. Firstly, it's a lot more X growth, right? Because it operates only in static. Parent company Vodafone does not allow it to go off into the rest of the world. It can only operate in SADC, South African development, Southern African development. Um, so it, it's restricted where it can operate. So like in South Africa, um, Lesotho. I mean, it completely owns the Lesotho market. All 12 contracts are with Vodacom. Um, and, but what are they? And ultimately, they are a utility, right? Data is a utility. But utilities are beautiful, boring things. And yes, they relatively, the margins are going to be under pressure. But they're just going to sell us more and more and more. So I used to, back in the day, and I've told this story many times, I used to pay 2,000 Rand per gigabyte of data. But I never bought a gig because not a 2,000 Rand. I used to use 10 megs of data a month. I now pay 72 Rand per gig of data, and I'm averaging 9 gigabytes of data a month. Now, that, I mean, is, that, that, that is only going to go one way. Your usage is going to go up. The price is going to go down. The margins will shrink but this is going to sell you more and more and more and more of this data. 
and 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 they they so they they fairly defensive. They're very defensive in the sense that you want to open a, t a, a cell phone company in this country, no chance. You need a cost for approval. A cost is not going to allow another one. They're the dominant player in South Africa. They have market share of just over 50%. Yeah, so I'll see a bit of a threat. Telcom, not really. MTN, yeah, who knows about MTN? But in a sense, do we see a future where we're, using, where we're not using our cell phone and data? No. Unless ESCOM goes, in which case we can't charge our phone. Do we see a future where our usage decreases? No. Our usage is increasing. Now, I understand usage changes, hey? I mean, I, I don't make phone calls hardly anymore. And when I do make a phone call, I use Skype or I use WhatsApp. I'm not paying a buck a minute when I can use Skype and it's about, I don't know, I think I get 100 minutes for four cents or something because it's just good old-fashioned data. So it's changing, but it's there. Metrofile. Metrofile is one of my absolute bulletproofs. What do they do? They store documents. What is more boring than that? Nothing. I mean, no disrespect to, uh, you know, I, I call them a boring company because when I met the CEO, the previous CEO, he told me they were a boring company. But he told me with pride in his voice, he was like, we are boring. Like, that's the best thing in the world. It is. They store documents. Why do they store documents? Because companies, by law, have to keep documents. That's the law. So when times get tough, what happens? Yeah, a, small, a few of your small customers go bust, of course. Times get tough, a few of your big customers like Standard Bank and the like process less documents, right? Because they're opening less accounts, there's less FICA going through. But the dip is fairly small. And then the good times come and off they go again. They're moving into digital, which is the future, but they're moving into that space. And when you have to store a document, you are not going to Joe's document storage in Point Road, hey? You're going to Metrofile. They have competition, but they dominate the market, and they will continue to dominate the market. They've got the BE credentials. They're expanding into, into Africa very, very carefully. They go with a major client. So a major client, Standard Bank, has a presence in Nigeria. They go into Nigeria, try and make it work. Turns out Nigeria is not working. They're losing about $5 million a month there. If they don't turn it around, they'll exit by the end of the year. But bulletproof business. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, and the, yeah, so, so, so you can store it somewhere else, but you get the box from them and stuff like that. They, they have, I mean, they, they have a, I suppose it is a monopoly. I mean, they, they, got, they, they got market share in this country of, of just over 60%. Um, they are the de facto. You know, if you talk to someone in the know and you say document storage, they say Metropol every single time. I own it. I've been buying tons of it below. When that seller was in the market, I was buying left, right, and center. Uh, clientel life, we have talked to. But what do we do? We've we got to understand the business, but we've got to delve in. So this is Vodacom. This is the dividends that they've paid since September of 2009. And what do I see with Vodacom is that their 2014 interim and 2014 final both went down. And that does not thrill me. But if you go back and you read, why did it go down? There were a bunch of issues. None the least, one of the big things that companies like Vodacom have is CapEx. So, you know, we're just starting to get 4G, but the rest, you know, the next thing is already 5G. Um, and once we've got 5G, make no mistake. I mean, is anyone here saying, I don't want high speed? No. You know, how much? I got a friend who's got, he lives in Scandinavia, Finland. So he's got gigabit uh, 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 fiber into his home. Gigabit. It's like, and now they're offering him 10 gigabit. And I'm like, dude, what do you want with 10 gigabit? He says, doesn't matter, I'll get it. And of course, he pays 24 euros for a gigabit down and no cap, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a concern. But if you read into it, yep, it's CapEx. They might not be bulletproof on the dividend. There might be some fluctuations. My sense and reading the, 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 the chairman's statement and those sets of results is that the dividend growth may slow a bit, but the dividend is fairly, is always going to be bulletproof. They're never going to pull it back. Are they going to do an MTN? Don't think so. Don't think so. Metrofile. So Metrofile almost went bankrupt. In fact, they technically did go bankrupt. They had far too much debt. Everything went pear-shaped. They got involved in the dot-com bust, boom. Everything went horribly pear-shaped. There's nothing better than a management team who were that close to being bankrupt. Man, because they are cautious going forward. 
Yeah, you go there and you want to have a you have a conference, they have it in the boardroom. You want biscuits, bring your own. I quite like that. Not if I have to go to the conference, but if I'm a shareholder, I quite like that. That is what you call bulletproof. That just ticks along. And what you can see is, so there's an interim at 9 and a final at 12. We've now got an interim at 11, and so simple math says final of 15 cents. Just ticking along, just going. And they're currently building cash because of their expansions they're doing into Africa. They've actually built too much cash. So I think that we're actually going to see the dividend cover increase. So they'll pay out more, and then we'll get a quick step up in the process. Uh, so Barlow World, I mean, I threw it in there. We, we agree that, that caterpillars mean that they're not massively defensive. But the trick here is that in 2008, which was for the uh, year ending 2007, financial year 07, they paid a two-rand dividend, right? And then, of course, the end of the world comes, and times get tough. But it took them until 2015 to get back to that dividend. Too slow. Now, it's a bad example because we'd already discounted them, but that's what we're looking for. That sense, if we go to, to, to here, so they drop the dividend from 395 to 375, and immediately a year later, it's back up. Other words, there was a small dip, and then it goes. We want a stock that has no dip, but that's, you know, are we going to find many of them? No. Metrofile is the one example, but their dividends only go back to 2011. Prior to that, they weren't paying. If we have the dip, we want a quick recovery. That is simply too long a recovery for me. No, I mean, they're, they're everything which doesn't meet the requirement. And, and this, if anything, just confirms it. Yeah, they pay nice dividends, but your dividend at one point dropped as low as 50 cents. Two rand to 50 cents. Ouch. Big ouch. Your, your red wine just started coming out of a box. So some ETFs. Um, Prop tracks 10. Stand Prop, which are both property ones, that's an equal weighted ETF. That's the SAPI uh, top 20. And then, of course, the prefix. I'll come back to that one. The yields there are a little disappointing. The reason why is because they're ETFs, they have uh, 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 costs and they claw those costs back via the dividend. So they get the dividends in, they take their costs, and then they pay you out. So we look at a property ETF and you say, yo, that's not much of a yield. But it's because of that cost there. The beauty of those is that you can put them in a tax-free savings account. So that all that 15% dividend withholding tax, not applicable. The risk of dividend withholding tax going to 20 or 30 or 60%, neither here nor there. Because you're within a tax-free savings account. Bonds, so the trick with bonds, and they all are, um, they are TFSA compliant. The RMB, INF has got stars on it because the name has changed. I thought it was changing Monday coming. It turned out it changed Monday past. It's now Ash INF. Uh, Ash Burton has taken over the <clears throat> RMB ETFs. So those two are total return indices, no dividends. The RMB is paying 2.3%. Man, that is not exciting. I, I cannot get thrilled over any of those numbers there. So they're there. They exist. Uh, doesn't work for me. Notwithstanding in a rising yield environment, I don't think bonds are the right place to be. But at those yields, bonds are definitely not the, the right place to be. Preference shares. So there's your prefix, which is an ETF, TFSA compliant, 8.66. That's a chunky yield. Even more chunky, there's a discovery ET, uh, pref and an invest tech pref, 9.38, 9.66. Those are solid, solid yields. But as I've said already, you can be getting, so as prime ticks up, those yields will tick up because they pay a percentage of prime. But if you put a hundred bucks in and you're getting out whatever, call it nine rand and change, in 10 years, you're still getting nine rand and change. So they're a parking place. If you're currently got money and you're saying, I don't know what to do with it. Uh, where do I put my money? And you don't want to buy red wine. Well, you can do worse than parking it in a, in a, in a, in a prefix or in, in, in a, in a, in a preference share. I would be careful come December, Standard & Poor's. I, 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 I just don't know what's going to happen I, when I say that. I, I fully expect the downgrade to junk from Standard & Poor's in December. The June review, I think, will pass. The December review, we will fail. They, they want our GDP, average, our GDP growth to exceed 2% for the period 2014 to 2017. We did 1.3 last year. We did 1.5 the year before. If this year we do 1%, we are lucky. That means next year we've got to do 7.5. 
anyone think we're doing seven and a half next year? That means downgrade. Simple as that, downgrade in December. I think we'll escape June. And I don't know how these preference shares are going to respond to the downgrade. Your, your yield is safe. I'm not saying your yield isn't safe. I don't know what will happen to the capital. So if you're parking money, you might want to unpark it in November. So ordinary and preference, so the, 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 the preference by its name gets paid dividends before the ordinary. In other words, they cannot pay an ordinary dividend unless they've paid a preference. If they pass the preference dividend, they have to pass the ordinary. Sometimes they are convertible and the like. In our country, almost exclusively not. The key difference is, is that you don't get a, a, a share of profits. You basically get, so what they do is they say, we will pay a percentage of prime. Some of them pay 70%, some of them pay 90%, some pay 110. So if the share price, and let's take the discovery one, the discovery share price has gone from 158 to 18, the preference share has done nothing. And when the discovery share price went the other way from 108 to 158, the preference share price did nothing. It's linked to interest rate. How liquid are they? So there is no market maker. So there's two points on that. One, there might not be liquidity. So there's a Liberty Pref, which at one point had a 22% yield back in the crisis days. And I put a client into it on his request. It was about 85 million rand. It took us nine months to get the position. And when he passed away, his heirs all phoned to complain because they couldn't sell them. Um, I told them, you guys are getting, you know, they, they, they were earning themselves 21 million rand a year in interest. I told them to keep quiet and spend the money. Um, but liquidity, so check the liquidity on them. Um, the other issue is with liquidity, is although they have a notational value, so the Standard Bank one, the value is 100 bucks, right? Because that's the debt. They trade below it. And the theory is then you're buying 100 Rand for 90 Rand. Very nice, but only if you can sell it for 100. They always trade at that slight discount. Properties, so if we drop to the bottom first, there's some, uh, the two ETFs. As I said, the difference is the stand prop. So there's a there's a, 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 a core shares one as well, but stand prop is slightly cheaper and therefore better yield. So some stocks. Let's start with Delta. So you go look at the properties and you see Delta. Almost every income fund in the country has Delta property in the fund. And on the surface, it looks really, really lacquer and everything else. You delve into it. I, I mean, you know, they're a fairly small stock. They've, the price has been under significant pressure recently, which pushes it up. They focus on non-major regional areas. In other words, they don't want to be in the center of Joburg or Cape Town or Durban. They want to go more into the regionals, the Peter Maritzburgs and the like. And they focus on government-tenanted buildings. I, I, government tenanted buildings I quite like. I mean, that's not, not the problem. Government's a fairly good tenant as a rule. Firstly, government will be around forever or we have major problems. Um, <clears throat> and secondly, government typically pays, unless you're the post office. But government usually pay, and the post office would love to pay their bills. It's just their checks keep on bouncing. Um, so government's not a bad tenant and you need long-term leases, 10, 20, 30-year leases. But to me, Delta's just too small. They've got a large amount of debt. They, 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 they're building their, their portfolio quite rapidly. And <clears throat> I look at, <clears throat> excuse me, and it just it, it doesn't make me feel comfortable to say, let's go and put a pile of cash into Delta. As opposed to high prop. And I appreciate, I mean, compared to 13%, 5.1 is a nothing yield. But high prop current debt, the, the, the debt level is currently in high prop, about 28% of net asset value. Uh, trading at a premium of about 15% to net asset value. So the valuations are not stretched. They've got a lot of space to expand. They hold the quality shopping centers. So in Joburg, it's Hyde Park. Yeah, Hyde Park's where they've got a shop where the, the cheap dresses are 55,000 rand. Uh, and if you want the fancy dresses, if you need to ask the price, can't afford it. Um, so they go really up market. They've got Canal Walk, and they've got uh, 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 in Rosebank, which if you know Joburg, Rosebank has become the place. The first Krispy Kreme goes there. The first uh, 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 Starbucks goes there, and neither of those impressed me, but nonetheless. Um, and Business Day TV is there, but having to move because it's too expensive. But they've got massively quality assets, a little bit of expansion into Africa, carefully purchased. They've got bought a Nigerian operation, 100% tenanted got tenants already. So they really, really strong, cautious management, which what that means is a more bulletproof dividend yield. And that's what you want. Retail bonds. 
So I put those in. These are not JC products by any stretch, but someone's going to ask me about them. Currently, nice chunky yields on the retail bond. So the inflation ones give you the, the rate plus whatever inflation is. Problem with these, again, quite simply, is that you're getting that rate forever. And you get your capital back. Your capital is 100% guaranteed. There are no costs involved. But you're not getting, you know, if you put your money in, if you put your 100 Rand in for five years, you're going to get 9 Rand 75 back every year for five years. And at the end of it, you get your 100 bucks back. So again, it's more a parking cash process rather than anything else. Offshore. So here, as I said, is the trick with offshore. So I hunted. So, so when I go offshore, it's quite simple. I'm looking for ETFs and I'm looking for New York ETFs only. Otherwise, my universe is too big. When I look for New York ETFs, I've got 1,260, and that is way enough already. And you start hunting for the yields. And you can find ETFs there with 40% yields, but, man, you look at what's inside them, and they are toxic. Um, the two that pop up is the iShares International, 5.38. Uh, but what is it predominantly? Financials and energy. Very skewed. The preferred shares, which is much like our preference shares in South Africa, 5.82. Again, it's financials. And I'm not saying I don't, I mean, I've got nothing against financials in particular. I'm just saying you're very heavily weighted into a particular sector. And a sector in particular, financials, is under the cosh in terms of regulations and compliances and the like. So those yields on shabby, remember, taxed at 30%. No tax-free savings account for these either. You can claim half of that dividend back, do the paperwork, jump the hoops, and pay a $30 fee uh, for the process. So as soon as we bring that into it, suddenly we're saying, yeah, okay, these are nice, but they're not, they're not setting the world alight. Now, all that way to go to New York to buy something that, frankly, we could have bought in Joburg. Um, and then if we try and put it all together. So the stocks that we've been looking at, uh, where's that one missing? Some my div tracks didn't prop up, didn't didn't come up. So there are two ETFs focused on dividends, right? Satrix dividend, Satrix Divi Plus, and the div tracks from uh, Core Shares. Both tax-free savings account compliant, of course. They uh, uh, ETFs. The trick with the div, the Satrix Divi Plus, is I think it's got a, a broken methodology. And what I mean by that is how they select. So they take 30 of the 100 shares, top 100 shares, and they take the forward dividend yield. So they owned African Bank, and they owned Kumba, and they owned PPC, and Astral, when all of those dividends went collapsing in an absolute heap, because for a period, the forward dividend yield was attractive. But they only require, the only thing they can look at is the forward, forward dividend yield. It'll be, you know, it might have its day in the sun again, but they're going to be days of significant pain for that particular ETF. So to me, DivTrax is the preferred. It comes from core shares. They first do a liquidity process, so they want liquidity issues. They want, they do volatility, so they remove, no, they start volatility. They remove the top 30% of volatile funds. Boom, just gone. If you're over, if you're in that 30% band of volatility, you're out. So they got 70% left. Of that, they remove the least, the lowest 30% in terms of liquidity. And they've got a pool left. And then they bring some more methodology in. But it's not just what is the forward dividend yield. It's been how long you know, they want, and I forget the exact numbers. Dividend must have been increasing for a certain period of time. They want a lot more than just a forward dividend yield. Again, it's not massive, 4% dividend yield. But it's certainly attractive. And the reason for that, again, is because of those internal costs. It obviously is tax-free compliant. And what I've done here, and I've just put this together just as an exercise not as a, as a recommendation. As I said, the one I own is Metrofile. I've got bids in the market for high prop. Um, I'm waiting for the market. In, in this type of market, if you want to buy something, don't step up to the plate. Put a price in a little bit lower down and let the market come to you. Um, and, of course, as sure as I say that, we're going to go and rally to 600 million thousand points. And, but I got some Metrofile. <laughs> You're long. I, I got some metro files that I think 380 change because I had a bit I'd forgotten about and someone sold them to me and I'm massively happy camper. Uh, clientele. But what we've done here and what you will note is on the stocks, I go careful on those two. I even go careful on those ones. What have I gone? I've gone ETFs. I like ETFs. I put them in a tax-free savings account. So boom, I'm immediately 15% ahead because I don't pay dividend withholding tax. Um, my stand prop as well. 
if we built that as it is, and I've got some cash and I've got some retail bond there, what do we get? First year dividend yield, 5.7%. That's historic, so that's what it would have paid you last year. In the first year going forward, we are probably be looking at, a, if we take our, our gross, and those are, and let's be honest, we'd be polite here, we call them guesses, because I can't see the future any better than anybody else. But a year forward, that 5.7 is probably going to be closer to 6.2. So in the first year, you get 6.2 back. Nice, not bad, not going to shoot the lights. It quickly goes 7, 8, within, five, within four years, we had, we had 9.6. What I haven't done here is reinvest the dividends. I'm assuming that you're spending the dividends. As soon as you reinvest the dividends, those numbers, your 9.6, you start hitting 10.9, uh, 11.1%. The reason I don't invest the dividends, I was saying earlier, the math is too hard to do in my head, and I have an objection to calculators, um, and because I'm making assumptions. And I want to make as few assumptions as possible. It's bad enough that I've had to assume the growth, now I reinvest it and start, and I'm starting to build a pyramid, which could be perfect, but could collapse in a heap in, in, in five minutes. The point being is that with all those restrictions, we can still come down to a portfolio that can generate in the first year, nice, but fairly quickly starting to gain, gather momentum. And when we take this and throw it 10 years forward, we're starting to create significant yield. And important, the yield is on what we did today. What I'm saying here, that 9.6 is on the 100 bucks we put in today. Of course, that 100 bucks has grown because of capital appreciation. And it's grown secondly because initially you reinvest in the dividends. So key point, it starts slow, yes. If we're looking for 10% in year one, I mean, we can do it, but we're going off to, to second tiers. We're going off to preference shares and, and stocks that may or may not be able to hold their dividends. But we can build a fairly bulletproof, and I stress the fairly, hey, there's no guarantees in life, um, and there's exactly no guarantees on the JSC a fairly bulletproof portfolio that can generate that income coming through. As is always the case, we're not rich any day this week. But if you've heard me speak before, I never promised this week. Promise this lifetime, perhaps. Your risks is quality. We've got to, not your risks, your, your process, we've got to go for quality. If we chase the lower quality in pursuit of dividend, we're only going to hurt ourselves. We're going to end up owning the Kumbas and the African banks of the world and the like. We've got to have those strong dividends. We've got to have that capital protection. There is certainly an issue around dividend withholding tax. The easiest way to resolve that is to go into ETFs in a tax-free savings account. As I said earlier, dividend withholding tax, I think, is, a, is an easy win for whoever the respective finance ministers may be going forward. And we've got a tough couple of years in our economy. I fully expect it at some point before things start to improve, I think we're going to see some hits to our dividend withholding tax. We really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you very much.